For the particularly well-read among you, I stopped too early because there's nothing we like as much as the opportunity to put a Monty Python reference into Scripture. You know the part where it says if they don't welcome you, bite your thumb at them. No, it doesn't say that. It says, if they don't welcome you, knock the dust from your sandals and move on, which regularly we interpret kind of like, bite my thumb at you and move on. And that's maybe the nice version. I think when Jesus says it, what he's meaning is don't let that encounter cling to you and move on in a continued spirit of gentleness. But hey, there are days I do a lot of thumb biting. This Galatians text uh, from Paul is summing up the letter uh, and it's kind of getting back to this final spirit Paul wants to exist in Christian community. Jesus' uh, moment in Luke 10, in many ways, is also a summing up, sending moment. Uh, if you didn't pick up on it, it's kind of like a youth mission trip, right? Here we are about halfway through the text, and Jesus says, it's time to send you on a little short-term mission trip. And boom, out into the world they go. Uh, if we had kept reading, you'll, you'll find that ends much the way a mission trip does too. They come back all like, we have so much power to do stuff, it's so awesome! And then they revert right back to the way they were before they left. Right? I mean, so some things don't change, right? Uh, but when Jesus does that, there's a couple little things in both these texts that I, I think we want to trigger on. Uh, first of all, it's fascinating in Luke that Jesus is being very strategic for a really organic guy, right? Did you pick up on the part of the text that Jesus says he's picked where to send them based on the places he intends later to go? He is using them to seed the soil of his own reception when he gets there. It's okay to use a little business acumen in the spreading of the gospel. Uh, but then there's that weird part, right? The, the no sandals, no shoes, no cloak, no talking to people on the road. I woke up this morning and the very first, a little thing about me, I preach my sermon all night long. Right, so like I don't really sleep, but but there's a moment of cessation of of like dream preaching, and then I like oh now it's time to get up. So I get up, and the first thought that hit my head was, it's really good Jesus won't be here at our house Sunday afternoon when we pack the car for vacation, because we take a little bit more than an extra pair of shoes. I mean we put the car top carrier on. We, we have scoped out places for all six of us to sit. Everyone has their own backpack with their own media equipment. There are more extension cords than there are at Best Buy in our car by the time we'll roll out Monday morning. Because we're used to living in the way our culture teaches us to want to live, which is fiercely unneedful of anybody else, right? I mean, targets are everywhere, so we could always buy something we needed. But we're, we know that when we roll out, we're good. We've got all the backups we could ever possibly want. There's already more people in our car than we want to have in the car. We don't need to meet up with anybody else on the road. But we've got family planned to see in varying places to go. In Jesus' call to his disciples, they're going for the exact opposite. Be in a position where you need the generosity of the people you land amongst, right? Now, for some of us, there's that really discordant phrase in there that says, don't even talk to people on the road. Um, but I think in the, if you look at the larger gist of that sentence, what he means is don't arrange encounters on the road. The whole point is to go meet new people, to land in new spots. Years ago, 
um, when I was living in the Philippines, we were moving from one uh, town to another. There were three of us, we're just backpacking, and um, my, it starts to rain, which it does 23 and a half hours of the day in the Philippines during the wet season and the wetter season. Um, they have four seasons in the Philippines. They're hot, hotter, wet, and wetter. Um, and, and so it starts to rain, and, and, they, and they're like, oh, let's go to this house. And we ran into this house. We just ran right in, and I'm figuring they're calling out to their friends. And because I'm not really great at Cebuano, it takes me a little while to get up to speed on the fact that we don't even know who these people are and they don't know who we are. We've just walked in their house uninvited. We didn't wait to knock or anything. We just went into their house, called out that we were there, and they came down and gave us coffee. That was the weirdest thing to me because if you live in a, in a country that's hot, hotter, wet, and wetter, I don't know why you drink coffee all the time, but they do. Like, I drink like 12 cups of coffee a day. Um, but I was just amazed at this idea that we would just walk into somebody's house, right? But, but that's the type of vision Jesus has for the journey that he's sending his disciples on. Go needful of the hospitality of others, not as the kukla's role, fiercely independent without the need for anyone, except maybe a target. Uh, and, and this, to me, starts to get at the nature of Jesus' mission the nature of what Jesus wants to talk about when he says the kingdom of God. A concept that the church has misunderstood since its inception. In fact, it's a misunderstanding that goes all the way back to the prophet Samuel, who when Israel says, we want a king, he says what? Thank you, Alan. I'm pretty sure that's whose voice that was. No, you don't. And they said, yeah, we're, we're pretty sure we do. And then Samuel says what in response that time? They're going to draft your son. By the way, like Alan, multi-generational preacher's kid, don't feel bad, y'all. It's just in him. He can't help himself. Um, uh, yes, a king, no matter how well-being they will start out, in the end it'll become about them, it'll become about their pride, it'll become about their power, and they will draft your sons and send them off to war. And the Israelites say, yeah, but we still want a king. And so they'll get one. They'll get Saul, and then David, and then Solomon, sort of Saul and David and then Solomon. And then after that, uh, Scripture's awesome because it just goes, goes, and then the next king is this. He was worse than the last one. And then we got this king. He was even worse. And, then, and you get the point. And they'll do that for hundreds of kings after that, right? So we learned that lesson so well that starting in about the third century, the Christian church said when Constantine was like, what do you think about becoming the religion of the empire? We were like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Nothing can go wrong here. <laughs> because we're enamored of this concept of king and empire. And because the language of some of our gospels are open to this idea of the kingdom of God, as if, as if that's what they meant. Let's be in pursuit of a Christian nation. So let's, let's listen now to what Luke says, because Jesus says, when you walk up to a house, and that house receives you in peace, and you share peace, then the kingdom of God is there. Right? Right? And if you walk up, we didn't get to this part, and they reject you and you have to move on, the kingdom of God was almost there too, right? The kingdom of God isn't a place. It isn't a structure. It isn't a hierarchical uh, ordering and forcing of a single way of life on the world. The kingdom of God is the spirit of gentleness sharing the truth in love 
as Paul tells us in the community of Galatians. Now, we have to admit, Paul doesn't always do that really well because he too is human, right? So like when he started out in Galatians, it's one of my favorite letters. The first letter I had to translate from Greek, so that's part of it. Um, but uh, but it, Paul normally begins a letter and, and he's like, hey, how you doing? This person says hi. I hope you're saying hi. I've been noticing you're doing some things really well. I got a, a couple of ideas for you, <laughs> right? He's kind of like your mom. Um, for those of you sitting really close to your mom, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, but in Galatians, he starts out with a big giant, hell no, what are you doing? You're getting it all wrong, right? By the end, he's calmed down. He, he screams himself out. Uh, but what, what Paul is trying to, to help us understand is that the practice ground for doing this kingdom of God way of life is supposed to be the people we live with the people we work with, the people we school with, the people we sit in the same pew with. Very much Allah later saying, if you can't love your brother and sister whom you see, then you can't love the God whom you do not. Right? And so it's why at the end of this Galatians, I think, Paul says we should be working for the good of everyone, but especially for the Christian community. It's not that he's, that he's being exclusive or anti-love uh, to anyone else. It's that grand thing, be good to everyone. But how do we do that? We do that through the relationships we know the most. And the sad reality for the church who has so regularly assumed that we'd love to be kings in our faith is that we haven't had a lot of peace among ourselves. We haven't had a lot of spirit of gentleness among ourselves, let alone the people who aren't supposed to agree with 90% of what we believe. I have this feeling, this suspicion um, if God doesn't like me being speculative about his thoughts, then I'm in big trouble. But I have this suspicion that Jesus sits sometimes at the bar with his dad, and, and, so, and they're watching some preacher preach about how Jesus overturned the money tables, so it's okay to get really angry at everybody. And, G and, and God looks at Jesus, and Jesus goes, I know, it wasn't my best day. Right? The overall text is about gentleness and love and the speaking the truth in love and, and how we're building each other up, not tearing each other down. And we tend to take that one text and, and use it as an excuse for why it's okay to lose it with each other. Right? Why it's okay to become abusive towards each other in the name of truth. And yet... Uh, the, the text over and again says to us, you, you've got to learn to love each other, but you've got to do that with gentleness and care and a light touch. You've got to figure out how to walk through this world as lambs and not wolves. I have felt convinced in a way I'm regularly not happy about that Jesus wants us to be a naive idealists and hold at bay the temptation to become jaded skeptics. I'm a really good jaded skeptic, y'all. I can bark at the moon with the rest, best of them. But Jesus is saying, I send you out like lambs amidst the wolves. I send you out as those who are needy of the help of their neighbors, not fiercely independent self-guided, unneedful individuals. I send you out as servants and not kings. I send you out forgiving, not blaming. I send you out to build up what others will benefit for, not to consume what you want. And that's a project that's amazing to behold. 
and incredibly difficult to do. Which is why Paul wrote so many dang letters. Speak to one another in a spirit of love that we might weave our lives together in which my independence is so tied up in yours that we can't help but call each other brother, sister, neighbor, friend. And that I can't do what I do without you. And you can't do what you do without me. Except it's not about me and you, it's about all of us. A network woven together, working towards a world more loving, more kind, more just, more gracious, in which the flourishing of all creation is worked out one encounter after another. I send you out lambs amongst the wolves. I send you out just the way my Father sent me. Go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord.